Uh, Dr. Ledley, and thank you uh, to the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, terrific conference. It's my first visit uh, to South Korea, and it's uh, been uh, an absolutely fantastic trip so far, and I'm hoping uh, this is the first of many. In the interest of time, let me get going here. I'm going to talk about mechanical circulatory support and bridge to recovery, heart transplant, and destination therapy. Uh, my disclosures, uh, I do uh, uh, do some training and speaking for Abiumed, and uh, my more important disclosure is I'm a surgeon, so I'm seldom wrong, but never in doubt. Uh, welcome. Uh, here's uh, another picture of Heinemann University Hospital in Center City, Philadelphia, where we do our work. And this is uh, one of uh, our ICU uh, patients, and I, I say in this slide, any port in a storm, because when you have a patient uh, acutely decompensating in cardiogenic shock, whatever you have on the shelf, uh, you need to grab. And uh, this uh, is an unusual scenario where we have a patient who you can see is uh, on ECMO, on an impella, on a balloon pump, uh, having uh, continuous uh, renal uh, dialysis therapy and our uh, nurse putting a happy face on it. So I'm going to review available technologies for short-term support uh, for bridge to bridge or bridge to recovery, options for long-term support in class four patients, and options for long-term support in class three patients. A lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, is either not FDA approved yet in the US or is not uh, approved for the indications I might be discussing. I'm also going to uh, try and get to some case reviews and uh, discuss a clinical management strategy for uh, choosing devices. Uh, first, uh, a little history. I like to use this slide as the first example of a mechanical circulatory support, which is really uh, primarily a biologic support system where Dr. Walt Lilly High used cross circulation to operate on children. And uh, some of those uh, children actually are still alive today. And his chief of medicine accused him of devising the first operation with the potential for a 200% mortality. This is uh, Dr. Gibbon. He is a, uh, another Philadelphia surgeon with a young lady who uh, he did the uh, first uh, operation on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. This slide uh, shows the first uh, 18 surgeries that were done using cardiopulmonary bypass. And uh, at the bottom there, uh, the uh, list of 17 of 18 is the number of mortalities that occurred uh, with the use of this new technology at that time. This is Dr. Charles Bailey. He was a uh, Hahnemann uh, surgeon. Uh, it's a little, little uh, history for uh, Hahnemann University Hospital. Dr. Bailey uh, did the first uh, open heart surgeries at Hahnemann using, doing uh, mitral uh, stenosis operations. Uh, Hahnemann was also uh, one of the first hospitals to do a uh, total artificial heart. This was uh, the totally implantable uh, Abiacor uh, total artificial heart. And recently, Dr. Jarvik uh, came to visit us, and we're going to be participating in his destination therapy uh, trial. And my partners, uh, Dr. Laub, our chief, and Dr. Kostik, uh, are with me there. So the surgeon's toolbox for advanced therapies for heart failure include transplant, mechanical circulatory support, ECMO, LVAD, BIVAD, total artificial heart. And also, let's not forget, we can often... Uh, do what are considered high-risk conventional uh, bypass surgeries or valve repairs on some of these patients. And sometimes we'll use mechanical support uh, for a brief period of time to help support these patients. Now, the role of mechanical support is to reestablish and maintain normal hemodynamics and support end organ function, limit in infarct size in uh, uh, acute MI cardiogenic shock, bridge patients to recovery uh, or uh, bridge them to long-term support or bridge them to transplant. So we have a, a number of options. We're fortunate uh, uh, in the States and at, at Hahnemann that uh, we have balloon pumps, impellas, tandem heart, uh, Centromag uh, uh, for use as uh, ECMO. 
Uh, we have uh, permanent devices, uh, HeartMate 2 at Hahnemann. We don't have HeartMate 3, but we have the hardware HVAD. Uh, the MVAD has not come to the U.S. yet, and we uh, will have the uh, Jarvik 2000 shortly. I'm also going to mention uh, possible Class 3 devices that are not currently approved uh, that may be in the near future, Circulite and Sunshine Heart. So here's a picture of the HeartMate 2. This is uh, a device that's been used extensively, uh, both for destination therapy and bridge to transplant. It's an axial flow, uh, continuous flow device. Uh, I think uh, one of the disadvantages of this device is that it requires an abdominal pocket, which can be a source of bleeding and infection, and it requires takedown of the diaphragm, which uh, can also be a source of bleeding and can cause uh, some significant uh, pulmonary uh, morbidity on patients who already have compromised lung function. There is another picture of it. This is the HeartMate 3. I've not yet had opportunity to use this device. The initial trials are occurring now uh, in Europe, and uh, an initial clinical trial is ongoing in the United States. This is a uh, centrifugal device uh, similar to the uh, hardware HVAD. This is the hardware HVAD, where, uh, which has been my go-to device uh, in recent years. And uh, it's an intrapericardial device. It does not require an abdominal pocket. And as you can see, this is a small device. Here's a picture of it with the uh, new MVAD, which is uh, hardware's latest device, which is uh, awaiting clinical trial first in Europe and then uh, hopefully soon in the U.S. This is a Jarvik 2000. I had the opportunity to be in his bridge to transplant trial. Uh, it's a device designed to be placed through a thoracotomy, which is nice in patients who have had multiple sternotomies. And uh, it was designed to allow uh, the graft to go either to the ascending or the descending aorta. It has an intermittent controller, which uh, allows the uh, ventricle to eject uh, about every 20 seconds, and that washes the aortic root to prevent thrombosis. Uh, recently, uh, this has been available in Europe, but in the destination therapy trial, the drive line uh, comes out from the uh, post auricular bone in the skull, which has a very low infection rate and allows patients uh, to shower and swim. So our uh, uh, Hahnemann University Hospital uh, best practices uh, for continuous flow devices, we selectively bridge uh, postoperatively with heparin. Uh, we uh, give 100 milligrams or greater of uh, aspirin. We keep INRs uh, relatively high at two and a half to three and a half. We shoot for mean blood pressures less than 90 or lower if the patients will tolerate it. And we do frequent echoes uh, to check volume status and adjust uh, RPMs. This helps mitigate pump thrombosis and uh, issues with stroke and GI bleeding. The potential class three devices I mentioned include Circulite, Sunshine Heart, and the Infant Jarvik, which is a uh, pump that uh, uh, Jarvik is designed for pediatric patients, I think may well be usable as a class three device, and I've had some discussion with Dr. Jarvik about that, uh, but that has not been looked at yet. This is the circulate, which uh, drains from the left atrium, outflow goes to the axillary artery. Uh, it's had issues with uh, pump thrombosis and has not uh, been approved for clinical use yet. This is a sunshine heart. Uh, basically, uh, the sunshine heart is an extra aortic balloon pump. The balloon wraps around the ascending aorta. Uh, you can see there are leads uh, at the apex and uh, in order uh, to time the device. One of the nice things about this device is since there's nothing in the bloodstream, it requires no anticoagulation. And this is a picture of the infant Jarvik device. I want to talk a, a bit about ECMO. Uh, it's, uh, your uh, centers uh, have been using ECMO as your primary mechanical support uh, you're familiar with it. ECMO is a pump in an oxygenator like cardiopulmonary bypass, but for long term. Uh, the Novolung is uh, like a quadrox deoxygenator with a low pressure gradient, so that's the oxygenator without the pump, and a VAD is uh, a pump without the oxygenator. This is our uh, primary 
uh, short-term pump uh, that we use in our ECMO circuits. The uh, Centromag pump was bought by Thoratec, which was now bought by St. Jude. It's a maglev pump, so there's no ball bearing in the bloodstream, so it's very resistant to uh, developing clot. The Quadrox deoxygenator is a long-term oxygenator that has very little uh, plasma leak. This is the uh, McKay uh, CardioHelp. This is a uh, portable ECMO unit, uh, which uh, I've used uh, in the past and will be getting uh, into uh, Hahnemann uh, at the end of the month. This is the Avalon cannula. We use this for our respiratory failure patients uh, who are on ECMO and hopefully uh, we'll get to a case uh, post-heart transplant where we uh, use the Avalon cannula. So patient selection for ECMO, uh, there's really no uh, absolute contraindications other than uh, uh, the extreme elderly patient, uh, patients who uh, have had a recent stroke or have other contraindication to anticoagulation and comorbidities. Uh, ECMO is uh, very versatile. It can be used uh, in a, a whole number of different uh, scenarios. Uh, and uh, we'll talk some more about its use in cardiogenic shock. Problem with ECMO, especially if you're looking at using it uh, to get a cardiogenic shock patient to recovery, is uh, that while it decreases preload, it does increase afterload, and it does not do anything uh, to lower left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So if you need to put a patient on ECMO uh, for cardiac support, it has to be venoarterial. If the patient is undergoing CPR, then it has to be venoarterial. If a patient has respiratory failure, but it's uh, devolved into a severe metabolic acidosis with unstable hemodynamics, then you need venoarterial. And then often, uh, once the acidosis is resolved, you can go to venovenous. Now, uh, in-hospital mortality for acute MI uh, is a problem that uh, we've not uh, improved upon much uh, despite uh, door-to-balloon times and uh, drug-eluting stents. The mortality uh, for cardiogenic shock ranges between 50 and 90 percent, and this is also despite early revascularization. So uh, mortality remains high because uh, impaired cardiac contractility can persist even after revascularization. And uh, by the time myocardial recovery might occur, we often have irreversible end organ failure that determines the patient's outcome. In a study uh, from the shock trial in the New England Journal, uh, balloon pump uh, was shown to be of no benefit uh, in patients with uh, uh, acute MI cardiogenic shock. And I think the reason for that is that the balloon pump is not a robust enough intervention. It doesn't lower left ventricular end diastolic pressure in order to get survivors in that group. This shows the effect of early revascularization. And uh, for those who have been in the VAD business for a while, it looks remarkably like the rematch trial data, where initial medical stabilization has terrible uh, outcomes. But even with early revascularization, although it's double uh, the improved uh, survival, the uh, survival is still not anything to be proud of. So in the New England Journal uh, paper looking at uh, the impact of door-to-balloon time and uh, mortality among patients undergoing primary PCI, uh, there is no improvement uh, in the uh, STEMI population. Uh, that mortality remained uh, virtually unchanged. And these data suggest that additional strategies are needed to reduce in-hospital mortality in this population. So treating with balloon pumps and inotropes uh, leads to the downward spiral of cardiogenic shock where you increase myocardial oxygen demand, uh, increase uh, cardiac work, and uh, don't really alleviate uh, end diastolic uh, pressure. Uh, placement of an impella device uh, does help relieve uh, end diastolic pressure and thereby reduces wall stress and limits uh, ischemia even without revascularization. So you decrease end diastolic pressure, end diastolic volume, you decrease oxygen demand, and you increase uh, perfusion of the aorta and increase myocardial oxygen delivery. If you look at, uh, at uh, patients who are undergoing uh, infarction uh, and you have uh, intervention of uh, balloon pump uh, or medical management 
or uh, impella, as you increase uh, the unloading of the ventricle, you decrease the size of the infarct. And then if you, de if you unload the ventricle prior to revascularization, that's when you have the greatest impact at reducing infarct size. And this shows a, uh, a myocardial perfusion scan with uh, LV unloading alone showing reperfusion of the ventricular apex uh, prior to revascularization. And if you look at, uh, this was with the uh, Impella two and a half, you look at the uh, improvement in survival when the Impella is placed before PCI rather than after, uh, significant uh, improvement in survival. Now I want to run through uh, a few case presentations. This was a 71-year-old gentleman who presented to the ER with chest pain. Uh, pretty standard uh, scenario. His enzymes were normal, so not an acute MI, and a diagnostic cath was performed the, the uh, following day. And by way of disclosure, uh, this was not a uh, patient that our interventionalists uh, worked on at, uh, at Hahnemann. Uh, this uh, is his initial uh, cath showing a uh, proximal LAD, mid-LAD, and circumflex lesions. Patients brought to the cath lab the following day for an intervention, and uh, here you might be able to see that uh, he's got an LAD dissection which occurred upon placement of the wire. Uh, this shows uh, uh, no flow continues in the LAD. This is uh, multiple hours later with multiple stents placed uh, uh, the length of the LAD. So uh, at this point, I was consulted. This was at a community hospital. Uh, the patient's now on 20 mics of dopamine, systolic pressure of 85, uh, six hours with no flow in the LAD. Uh, the patient's been loaded with Plavix and is currently on an Angiomax drip. And whenever I present this case to surgeons, I ask them, well, what, what would you do with this patient? And uh, very few uh, would choose to try and revascularize him at this point. But what we did is we took the patient to the OR, uh, put a graft on to the axillary artery, uh, put a uh, sheath inside the graft, and then placed the impella through the sheath. So post-op is hemodynamics normalized, troponins decreased from 200 to 100, and uh, the patient uh, was able to be extubated since the device was placed in the axillary artery, uh, and so he could be uh, uh, sat up and uh, even ambulated. His uh, pulse pressure recovered as his ventricular function recovered. The impella was removed on post-op day five with uh, almost complete recovery of his ventricle, and the patient was discharged home without further intervention. It raises the question, is LV decompression more important than revascularization in the early management of uh, the STEMI patients? This is uh, another patient. Uh, this is a 36-year-old gentleman with a dilated cardiomyopathy. He is on our transplant list, and he came in with decompensation. He required uh, urgent intubation and was hemodynamically unstable despite being on uh, two inotropes at high dose. The patient was taken emergently to the OR for placement of an Impella 5.0. His hemodynamics stabilized, uh, creatinine normalized, and then the patient was taken electively to the OR for a durable device as a bridge to transplant. So we improved our uh, likelihood of a good outcome by stabilizing the patient with a temporary device and then moving to a durable device under control conditions. So uh, this was an example of a bridge to a bridge. This is a picture of him uh, when he uh, was in the hospital on inotropes. You can see he's uh, in fulminant pulmonary edema. This is uh, with placement of the uh, impella, which you can see here, sitting uh, across the aortic valve with the tip in the LV apex. And then uh, placement of a hardware HVAD as a bridge to transplant. The last uh, case I'm going to present to you is a 30-year-old gentleman uh, who had a history of familial cardiomyopathy. He uh, received a heart transplant in July of 2010. Uh, he um, developed a uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder uh, requiring chemotherapy. He had multiple hospitalizations, and in 2015, uh, in August 2015, he again was receiving chemo for his lymphoma. 
Uh, he got uh, multiple drugs, and uh, after his chemotherapy, his uh, absolute neutrophil count uh, dropped significantly, and he developed massive hemoptysis. CPR was initiated, and uh, despite uh, being intubated, he had clotted off his airway, so he couldn't be ventilated. You can see his pH uh, dropped to 6.9 with a PCO2 of 160, uh, an O2 sat of 26% with uh, declining hemodynamics. And there's a picture of his chest X-ray. So he was placed uh, initially on venal arterial ECMO. Here you can see uh, the venous cannula going up uh, to the right atrium, the arterial cannula and his femoral artery. A uh, uh, endobronchial blocker uh, was placed to prevent uh, spillage of blood into the, uh, into the other lung to try and protect it. Interventional radiology performed a bronchial artery occlusion in the interventional radiology suite to try and control the bleeding. As remember, we, we're anticoagulating uh, the patient uh, while we're on venoarterial arterial ECMO despite the fact that he's having an acute bleeding episode. After 48 hours on VA ECMO, his acidosis uh, improved and his cardiac function recovered. So now uh, on peripheral ECMO, he had uh, his biologic pump was competing with his mechanical pump uh, for blood volume. So we now converted him to venovenous ECMO since he had cardiac recovery. There you can see uh, placement of the Avalon cannula through the right IJ. So the Avalon uh, was removed uh, several days later after his lungs had recovered, and this was his chest X-ray at the time of discharge. So it was a true multidisciplinary save between cardiology, hemonc, anesthesia, pulmonary services, interventional radiology, and cardiac surgery. So you need to tailor the device and mode of support to the patient's need, needs, anticipate how and when those needs will change, and adjust accordingly. So uh, just a general strategy, LV uh, needs to be decompressed in order to achieve uh, recovery. The chest must be closed. There can't be any lines in the groins to prevent mobilization of the patient, and end organ perfusion must be maintained. Uh, mortality after uh, successful complex cardiac surgery or complex peripheral intervention uh, is often related to end organ dysfunction while uh, myocardial recovery occurs, so temporary devices can help significantly improve outcomes. Uh, a balloon pump uh, is, does not provide adequate end organ perfusion or decompress the LV uh, in these uh, acutely ill cardiogenic shock patients. Uh, central ECMO or conventional short-term LVADs or BIVADs uh, introduce significant risk uh, versus uh, just uh, being able to place a device uh, through a peripheral uh, cutdown. And uh, often these patients have had previous open heart surgery and would require an open chest post-op. Uh, the ability uh, to do uh, a uh, peripheral uh, stick or cutdown and get five liters of flow is a significant improvement. Peripheral ECMO will not decompress an LV that is not ejecting and will not lower left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So uh, it's difficult to achieve recovery in those patients. So uh, the gold standard uh, is recovery, uh, maintenance of normal uh, function. To date, the chronic cardiomyopathy patient recovery is exceedingly rare. In the acute MI patient uh, complicated by cardiogenic shock, recovery uh, is achievable. And here is... Uh, the, our uh, team uh, performing a, a heart transplant. Uh, one of the residents caught uh, the picture at an opportune moment where you can see the donor hearts in my right hand. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention, and uh, I guess we'll uh, do questions at the end.